Hello and welcome to episode 135 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, some facts to compare fossil fuel land use with renewables. Your racist uncle is not going to be happy. The founder and former CEO of Nikola Motors has been found guilty of fraud. Turns out rolling a truck down a hill and pretending it works can get you in trouble. It may get more expensive to charge an EV overnight, and it has nothing to do with the fact that I now get up to pee six times a night. The country of Greece runs on 100% renewable energy for the first time. The Olympic torch is lit by the sun, so why not all the lights in the country too? All that and so much more in this edition of The Clean Energy Show. Well, welcome to the podcast, everyone. Also this week, VW has hired Ewan McGregor to help them sell EVs. Brian has his first ever book report. Looking forward to that. And a corporation based where Brian and I live is betting big on nuclear revival thanks to the war in Ukraine and other factors. You sound funny this week, Brian. Are you got under the weather? Yeah, I got a cold. What? How do you know? I, I thought colds were eradicated. Yeah, this is my second cold since the start of the pandemic. Are you looking telephone poles? What what do you what's going on here? Yeah, well, we took a, a plane trip, as you know, last weekend to Whistler. Aha! I knew and, you would uh, get diseased. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of worried we'd get COVID, didn't get COVID, uh, but we got a cold. My partner got it first. I was a few days behind. I thought I may have escaped it, Yeah. but it's uh, starting kind of yesterday, and my head is slowly filling up with fluid. Is it a bad it's cold? it's rather unpleasant. Oh, no. Oh, no. And you're sure it's a cold? You both tested. When did your partner get it? Yeah, like three or four days ago, and, and she's been testing every day, and I tested this morning. It's It's definitely a cold. Do you believe it on the Whistler trip? Yeah, I think so. Well, you know, you remember before COVID when you used to <laughs> <No>. fly? It, <laughs> it always seemed like uh, I would always get a cold whenever I flew somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you're all, everybody trapped on an airplane like that. And not wearing masks. Um, you know, they say that air is recirculated and filtered, but, uh, you know, I don't think uh, it's just too close a quarters. Do you put on an air in your face? Because I'm always a bit warm on planes. Like I, I make sure I get the air going at my face. Do you do that? Yes, and we discussed that as we got on the plane because I, I said to my partner, well, wait a minute, is this like COVID-filled air that I'm putting in my face or is this fresh, clean air? And it has just gone through the filter, so presumably that is the fresh, clean air. It always smells fresher to me. It always smells yeah, like yeah. it's mixed, like a car vent, like it's mixed in with outdoor air. I don't know that it is. It'd be nice if it was, but there's not enough oxygen yeah. up there at 35,000 feet to do that. M mixed in with new plane smell. I, I think I would just wear the oxygen mask, you know, just drop the oxygen mask and put that on for the trip. Why? Well, that'd be fantastic. They should just uh, let us have those. Yeah, it should be enhanced air with nice, relaxing uh, Demerol vaporized or something <laughs> to just put you at ease and <laughs> wake up wherever you're going. Uh, guess what? The pipeline plane flew over the other day. I walked up my front door and there it was looking at me. Oh, wow. So it's Mac, which is a relief. And yep. uh, perhaps why I haven't noticed it is I noticed because I went to my app and it's flying a few hundred feet higher than it was before. It's flying at 200 feet before. Yeah. Now it's up to 500 feet. I don't know if that has anything to do with the crash that was fatal. Yeah. A month so ago. to recap, James has a pipeline behind his house and there's a plane that inspects it pretty much every day. But yeah, there was a crash of one of these planes not that long ago. And uh, so it disappeared for a while. And you say now that it's back, it's actually flying higher. Yeah. I mean, it could be the same plane. I don't know that it's the one that crashed or if they were grounded or if, you know, they re-looked at um, how they did these things. But it seemed like it was gone for a few weeks. And, you know, because I noticed it. I, it's hard to say how often it came. It seemed to vary. But, you know, it was multiple times a week, I would say. And yeah. I do live in a city. Uh, it doesn't inspect it that often outside the city, just inside the city. It has frequent flights and it goes right back yeah. to the airport 10 minutes later. So, Well, and you always hear about these pipelines and they, you know, I don't know, sometimes they're leaking for uh, probably hours or even days before anybody notices. That's right. And, you know, I'm, uh, my EV, I'm enjoying it still. It's quiet. It's just, I'm still getting used to it not making this horrible yep. noise. Yep. And, I spent a bunch of money and now it runs nice. And uh, I haven't paid any of that off yet. Maybe a little bit, but not much. So, and my mortgage rate is going up uh, in uh, February. So I'm just, you know, 
Plus, my daughter's going to Quebec in February. So, Brian, I have to rob a bank. I mean, I have to do the exact same thing that meth heads do. I have to go out and rob something. I just don't know what yet. Damn it. Well, you better edit out this part of the podcast. Yeah, because you know what's going to happen is there's going to be video footage on the evening news of somebody who looks just like me robbing something, and it's just going to be a terrible coincidence, and I'll have me and saying... they'll play the clip of that audio from our podcast. Right. <laughs> well, let's get to some updates to some of our stories that we've talked about over the past. There's a few this week. Um, you know, we were talking about PM Trust. And, uh, in, yeah, the new UK Prime Minister. And I called her dumb, dumb, dumb last week. Yeah, she's real dumb. And that's because she doesn't like the sight of solar panels on farms and she was going to kibosh solar everywhere. Yeah. How dumb can you be, I ask? And well, <laughs> turns out the country is in agreement, not for that reason, but mostly for other reasons. In fact, um, how is Liz Trust doing? 83% say badly, 15% <laughs> say well. Should she resign? 55% uh, say yes, and I'm in that 55%. Uh, although, you know, who knows who they're going to get in their place, but you know, come on. I mean, there's, there's so much data for renewables being a good thing in this energy crisis, like saving billions over the summer, reducing yeah. the amount of, uh, Russian gas imports by 13% than over yep. just from the growth of it. It's just crazy. I mean, if there's all kinds of numbers you can look at. We talked about, uh, Tesla not, uh, having their full self-driving beta software, which you use being applicable in downtown Toronto. You mentioned that before, but now it sounds yeah. like it will be. Yeah, this is a while ago. So Toronto has streetcars. Um, one of the few, maybe only city in Canada that has streetcars. And um, yeah, the full self-driving software thus far has not known how to deal with streetcars. And so just to be safe, uh, Tesla has basically geofenced the software. So Anywhere downtown Toronto where there is streetcars, you can't use full self-driving beta until they figure out how to program in uh, streetcars. And yeah, apparently they're getting close because rumors that the, the geofence will be removed soon. Yeah, I was watching one of these informational videos on YouTube about um, how Toronto is a car city. And, you know, these are streetcars everywhere. These have them in Mount Pleasant where my friend Dan lives up north um, yeah. and all kinds of different places. And they had a you know, a vote to get whether to keep them or not. Everybody resoundingly wanted them. So what they do, yeah. they get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to make room for more cars. Yeah. They built the subway to make room for more cars. That's, yeah, that's what the was thinking was. It's too bad because, um, like, out here in the West, Canada is kind of sparsely populated and our cities are kind of spread out. But in the central or eastern part of Canada, like, you know, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, that's the densest population that we have in Canada. So Toronto particularly, there's several million people that live in Toronto, a lot of them in the concentrated in the downtown core. So, you know, public transit is a no brainer. Uh, subways and streetcars are a no brainer. And, you know, they've done fairly well at that. But yeah, surprisingly, it's it is still kind of a car city. Um, but I have been watching um, a YouTube channel. Can't think of the name of it right now, but there is a guy, a transit nerd in Toronto who's reporting on all of the transit projects. So things actually do look bright. I think things are improving. There are subway expansions planned and uh, streetcar light rail expansions planned. They have lots of stuff in the works. Um, and they've added a lot of bike lanes too. That's, that's really um, a positive sign, like yeah. definitely you know, you and I lived there, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. And uh, there wasn't that many bike lanes. 20 years ago, I guess. More than 20 years ago for me. Jesus, 25 yeah. years ago. Is oh, my really God. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, it was still kind of fun to bike in Toronto. I remember you and I biked. There's a nice path down by the waterfront. Yeah. You and I biked down and watched the fireworks one night. That was a lot of fun. The only thing is, is that it, it, it borders the Don Valley Parkway, which is a freeway, and you get all the exhaust and all the pollution. Yeah. I was, you know, as a prairie boy, I, it was very disconcerting to see, you know, the distant trees obscured by smog. Yeah. Which, you know, just sort of gathered in the valley like that and stunky. There's a smell to it always and... Um, yeah, but a lot of people die, cyclists die in Toronto, so it's not a safe place. But I remember cycling downtown. I lived adjacent to downtown in East York. It used to take me a half hour to get to the heart of downtown by bike, which was, you know, more enjoyable in the summertime than 
taking the subway and waiting and getting stuffed like sardines somewhere and, you know, the whole noise of everything. Um, but yeah, bike lanes are tough in, in cities like that, but it's also got the busiest freeway in North America too. The 401 is nasty, yeah, nasty massive freeway. Massive freeway. Dozens of lanes, it seems like. Uh, the Kia EV6. Now, I was shocked to learn that that came out almost 18 months ago now, on the spring of 21. I, I thought it was in the last three quarters of a year for some reason. Yeah. Maybe it's because I heard about it and I didn't pay much attention to it because it was a, a similar vehicle to the Ionic 5, although it's, you know, it's not a direct comparison necessarily yeah. uh, in aesthetics and, and appeal. Uh they sold only uh, 6,100 units of that worldwide in September. And if that isn't shocking enough, that's actually down from the year before. Down. Yeah, well, I assume it's just because it's production, not sales. I mean, I'm sure they can sell every one that they make. Um, you know, they just need to make more of them. And they're not. But that's a major problem, Brian. Yeah. That gets my trombone of the week. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the emphasis. <laughs> I am very disgusted by this. Uh, so the Nero EV sold 4,500. The Seoul EVs outside of, this is outside of South Korea. The Seoul EV sold a whopping, are you sitting down? Yes, you are, 292. The Seoul EV, 292 worldwide. Uh, tell me something. The, you, you can't sit there on your pompous Kia ass and tell me that they're not Asianizing EVs, that they're not ha taking the same sort of idea as Japan and saying, we don't believe in them. Because they're making great EVs. Yeah. And you know what pisses me off so bad? I watched a football game, an NFL game, and there was nothing but EV ads, including the Ionic 5. Great yeah. ad, great car. Can I buy it? Nope. Yeah. Can't buy it. Why are you advertising it? All the there's lots of other stories like that too. Why, why are they selling them? Why are they pretending that they can sell them? Are they trying to get people into the dealership to sell combustion engines? I mean, what's going? Are they just trying to look like they're advanced, or do they just not give a crap? And I think they're probably trying to stop people from going to EVs that are available. So if you're a loyal yeah. Kia or Hyundai owner, then you can think to yourself, okay, well, you know, there's there's Kias on the horizon. Um, there's some reviews out lately on the web of the Ionic 6, which is the upcoming Hyundai. But it's not coming until next year. But, you know, they've let out some sort of review models and there's lots of, you know, YouTube reviews. Yeah. And, yeah, it looks like a great car. But, again, like it's not going to be available for it's premature. Uh, you know, at least a year. It's premature so, to even do that. I'm going to forget yeah. about it by the time I could actually <laughs> order one. I yeah. mean, it's going to be ancient history. But it also looks like a, a great car. Well, they, yeah, of course it is. They're, that's the frustrating part. If they weren't great cars, it wouldn't be so frustrating, would it? But they're making <laughs> great cars. They seem to know what they're doing, but have they secured the batteries? Do they want to make them? It doesn't seem that way. Yeah. Well, we have an update coming up later on from VW that addresses some some of these issues. And when you can buy them, you certainly can't buy them where Brian and I live because we're not in a ZEV, zero emission vehicle jurisdiction or anything like that. And we're not in Europe. Yeah. So that's kind of kind of sucks. So, uh, yeah, you have one here, Greece was powered by renewables yeah i um i just always like good news stories like this i mean it's going to become more prevalent so at a certain point we'll have to stop reporting on these because it's just too common an event but yeah greece for around five hours ran on 100 percent renewables on october the 7th and uh yeah i just love stories like that because it's a sign of things to come it uh, shows us that this stuff is working. Uh, I assume the people who are against clean energy take it the opposite way. Like, well, it only ran for five hours. Uh, that doesn't count. Well, wait until we um, get to 2050, people. I tell you, when our jurisdiction runs on 100% renewables for 10 seconds, I'll soil my <laughs> yeah. pants on the podcast. No, that'll be a day for uh, celebration. We'll have some champagne. Yeah, tell you what, day. dig up my corpse and put a birthday cake on it when that <laughs> happens for you, because it's going to be something. Yeah. <laughs> From Bloomberg, carbon capture projects hit a record. So 
The pipeline of carbon capture projects rises to 153, uh, 33, or pardon me, 30 are operational right now, including one in our jurisdiction, which is at a coal plant, one of the first in the world, and it's not performing up to specs at all. Um, planned projects that are planned, remember, not existing, but planned, would mitigate less than 1% of CO2 emissions. And the problem, in addition to just being 1%, is that it continues investments in fossil fuels. It's another way of prolonging fossil fuels, which, as anyone who listens to the show on a regular basis knows, makes James angry. James doesn't want to be angry. It takes days off yeah. my life, Brian. Well, as I've said before, I, you know, I was kind of in favor of this because, like, we are a coal-burning place where we live. And they started talking about this 20, 25 years ago. And back then, it's like, oh, that kind of makes sense because, you know, we just didn't know enough back then. Like, it was solar exciting at the time. It was exciting. I was excited about it. It was very it. exciting at the time. Um, but also, you know, bureaucracies are lumbering and slow, so it took them forever to get it off the ground. And now that these things are running, we know that they're just too expensive and they don't produce the results. So uh, let's just buy solar panels with the money instead. I remember when they opened it, they invited dignitaries from around the world into a tent. Oh, yeah. But it had a weird vibe. It's like there was no <laughs> one commenting on it. No one's had anything to say. And they were hoping to export the technology. Not only did they invest billions of dollars, but they wanted to export that technology, which I'm sure they've learned a couple of things that they can export, maybe patent. But critics argue that it's expensive, ineffective technology that just prolongs the life of fossil fuels, which I'm sure our local governments here would love to do. Yeah, and I, I guess there was a possibility that they could take what they learned and refine the technology and make it cheaper and make it more viable, but so far that has not been the case. Well, I'm excited, Brian, because it's time for a brand new segment on the show. And that segment is... Tort. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's Brian's It's the first before. time you've sang on a sex. <laughs> and probably the last. <laughs> hey, I harmonize with myself. Yeah. I uh, I watched my friend who can sing do that for uh, video projects that I used to work on. <laughs> so I tried it and it kind of worked. But, you know, huh? if you, next time, just, just, you know, you got multiple tracks there if you want to. Let's play that again. Let's just... <laughs> Tort. Yeah, because we may never hear it again. So yeah, I have to <laughs> yeah. have to play it twice. Well, it seems unlikely. Yeah, it's not often that it's going to be appropriate to talk about a book. I mean, and, how many can uh, you read? You're just retired. I, yeah, I mean, it's it's I and I certainly don't typically read books about climate or clean energy or climate change or whatever. Uh, but this one's an exception because it's a picture book, which Ooh. you know barely even counts as a book. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, a graphic novel. Really? It's a graphic memoir. So this is a book called Ducks. My memoir Two is years graphic. in the oil sands. What's that? My memoir is graphic. <laughs> but okay. Yeah, Ducks, Two Years in the Oil Sands, and it's by Kate Beaton. And it is published by my favorite publisher, which is Drawn and Quarterly. They publish graphic novels of all different kinds. Um, but yeah, it's a graphic That's a good name for novel. a publishing company that publishes. Yep. Drawn and Quarterly. <laughs> They're the best. Um, but yeah, this book is really great. So uh, Kate Beaton is an artist from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, from here in Canada, the east coast of Canada. And she graduated from university with a history degree around 15 years ago or so and graduated with a mountain of student debt. Mm -hmm. And so she was kind of looking at the jobs that were available to her with a history degree, like working in museums and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, she was like, oh my God, I'm going to be 90 years old by the time I pay off my student debt. So she, like a lot of people from Cape Breton, from Newfoundland, from the East Coast of Canada, uh, took a job in the oil sands of Canada, which is, you know, here in Alberta, next door to us in Alberta. This is kind of based around the, the city of Fort McMurray, mm -hmm. kind of northern Alberta. That's the kind of base for many of these oil sands operations, which are, you know, as we discussed before, the dirtiest oil on the planet comes from there. The, the um, amount of energy you have to expend to extract this oil because it's all mucked up with sand and everything. Um, so it's a very, you know, carbon intensive, energy intensive way to 
get oil out of the ground. But, you know, with the price of oil, it's been a, a lucrative place for many years. So, yeah, she spent two years in the oil sands, paid off her student debt, which is, you know, the happiest part of the book. Like, she did completely pay After off her two student years. debt. After two years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you make a lot of money. You're often provided housing. Um, sometimes you live in the town of Fort McMurray, which is a fairly big town, so that's kind of civilized. But quite often you work on site or you work in these work camps where the oil rigs are and all this stuff. Um, so it's kind of isolated work and you'll often work like, you know, 12 days on and have two days off, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, with your housing kind of paid for, you can just bank a lot of money or, you know, spend it on cocaine, which is apparently a thing that also happens a lot. <laughs> I, I never said that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, it's just a, it's a really beautiful book. There is many things about it that are heartbreaking, but it's, uh, yeah, it's just awesome. Highly recommended. It's a real honest portrait of what goes on in the oil sands. So there's sad parts about it, but also, you know, funny parts and fun parts. And, and uh, there's a real humanity to it. Um, highly recommend. Well, send me a link and I'll put it in the show notes for gosh sakes. So check your show All notes, right. people. I assume that uh, there'll be a link close to the top of the notes there. Um, well, I, I, I have no comment on it. I can't see a picture. <laughs> I can't. It's hard for me to judge on a podcast what uh, what this book is like. Can you describe anything? Uh, it, paint me a picture with your words, Brian. Well, it's it's over four hundred pages, which is um, really great for a graphic novel because you can you know you tend to read those kind of quickly because it's mostly pictures. But um, but my favorite kinds of graphic novels are those kind of big epic ones that are that are quite long and um, it's just yeah it's just a really honest portrait of life there you just feel like you've really kind of been there and you kind of you know experience it vicariously okay okay because my my son's got a buddy who was in psychology at our local university he switched over in history and i just uh, my god that's worse than film that's uh <laughs> what you and i did <laughs> it's just, i felt you know chills come over me it was kind of bad like you know you poor bastard you know psychology we need Lots of people in psychology, more than ever. Uh, history, uh, not so much. Yeah. Not so much. Yeah, and she, she, uh, the author, Kate Beaton, she's most known for a book and a website called Hark a Vagrant, which is uh, history-based. She sort of did these humorous cartoons about history, which she knows a lot about because she has a history degree. But if you've ever wondered what life is like in the oil sands, this is probably your best chance to to find out what that's like. Yeah, well, Okay. I uh, I have some idea, and it's uh, I don't know. It doesn't appeal to me. A lot of people from across the country go there to, to work, and you know, a lot of Newfoundlanders uh, who are ancestors fished for a living. They went from the coast out there to yeah. work, make yeah. lots of money. And then the, you yeah, know, the people who work there often come from places where you know the fishery has collapsed or the coal mining has collapsed, and. Uh, you know, they have to work far away from home. Well, there's a new Stanford University study that uh, Forbes had a piece about. It's about EV charging at night may not stay cheap through the EV adoption curve. Uh, now, the thinking is, is that with everybody having EVs, they're all going to charge at night. So the power, they're not going to have excess power at night. They're going to have enough or they're going to have to keep up even. Um I tend to be cynical about such assertions because uh, I don't know how much you drive, but I, I I might charge like an hour or two a day. You know, a lot of days that I'll just charge an hour or two. I don't yeah. have. I'm not talking about people with long commutes or buying EVs to save money, and that's obviously a different story. And highway travel and vacations, but typically, I mean, statistically, people travel 20, 30, 40 miles a day. And yeah. that's an hour or two of charging, essentially. Uh, and, you know, we come home and we turn on our clothes dryers and our ovens every night and the grid doesn't go down. Yeah. So, and, and you know, we've gained a lot of efficiencies in those things too, right? Yeah, I guess the only issue would be that they're used to having very low usage overnight. So a lot of the systems within the grid are planned for that. Yeah. But, you know, they should be able to tweak those plans and, and make more power available overnight. 
Well, here's what they said. They said that um, the researchers estimate the impact of rising EV ownership in the Western United States could boost power demand by as much as 25% by 2035. That's the year when California has banned the sale of new gasoline vehicles. It doesn't mean they're all going to be EVs by then, of course. It just means that you can't go out and buy one. So charging after 11 will get more expensive, they figure, and push utility operators to boost their power generation. They say that more EV charging should be done during midday hours, uh, ideally at work or public stations. Now, this is when, you know, maybe the, this is not necessarily every day, right? But when the solar, when they, there's days when they have excess solar, it's already happening in California. We've talked about it. Um, lots of news stories talk about it. So when wind and solar power suppliers are at their peak, sometimes producing more energy than the grid can even handle. So California is set to have 5 million EVs by 2030. That's about 30% market share level. You know, 2030 is not far off. It's coming. And at that mm -hmm. point, the electrical grid will experience significant stress, they think, according to uh, that, unless there's increased capacity or behavioral changes. But... This gets me to thinking, Brian, that we're going to just need a smarter grid. We're going we're gonna to have to start thinking um, and being incentivized to charge when there is excess solar, when there is X, you know, because uh, if I had a, a, a normal EV that you could buy for four or 500 kilometers, 200, 300 mile range, I would probably charge it once a week in the summertime, right? I mean, I wouldn't charge it very often. Well, maybe I wait till... I get a note on my app saying uh, yeah. power is free for the next two yeah. hours. So yeah. I take up my other app and my EV starts charging. Um, you know, maybe something like that. Maybe that's a little too cute and easy maybe. But we're going to have to maybe, in order to accommodate renewables, um, start, you know, because we're already doing it. There are already experiments like you, you had a story a week or two ago about um, governments, the utility controlling thermostats as an experiment, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So when they have excess, to, when they don't have enough power, they t adjust your thermostat a little bit. And they did that voluntarily in California. So I don't know. It's uh, by having electric vehicles capable of charging, you know, to the grid, discharging to the grid. That's another thing, right? I mean, that's yeah. that would maybe even offset a lot of the problems when you have those little peaks because uh, the, the EVs that are charged might be able to backfire, and they if they make it worth your while financially, and I think they would, um, that you know could help flatten the curve. Yeah, downsides to having all those EVs on the grid, but also potential upsides. Yeah, and then there's school buses, you know, well, and city buses and things like that that will be sitting around and, and able to uh, to pick up. Because um, a lot of times you build the grid for the worst case scenario. Now, if you got a million EVs out there that can cover that worst case 10 minutes or, you know, uh -huh. something like that, then it, it really changes the game. So, yeah, I, I'm just starting to think like that. The uh, average mileage per day, by the way, is 20 miles in the UK, 37 miles in the United States. Uh, and EVs won't need charging more than once or twice every week or two. Um, so looking forward to that. Plus, you know, your battery doesn't get messed with as much if you're not charging as much. Uh, certainly a lot more charging for us in the winter when it's deadly cold. So Nicola is back in the news. Now, we used to talk about Nicola all the time when we started our podcast two and a half years yeah. ago, didn't we? I mean, it was an exciting potential good thing. It was the Rivian of, uh, let's say, long distance uh, semi-trucks, but um, no. Yeah, so um, this has been going through the courts for quite a while, but uh, Trevor Milton was the founder of Nikola Motors, or one of the founders, and was the CEO. And um, yeah, he's now guilty of fraud, three of four counts, guilty on three of four counts, um, basically guilty of pumping the stock. So, you know, Nikola was working on like a hydrogen uh, semi truck. And uh, this is the most fun story is that they just rolled it down a hill and shot video of it and uh, sort of tricked everyone into believing that they had a working uh, prototype, uh, which they did not. And then at other things, like they would show these these trucks and vehicles at at shows and, you know, people with an eagle eye would spot that they were, hey, wait, this is plugged into an electrical cord underneath there. Yep. And uh, so they were just uh, fudging the truth. But when you're a publicly traded company, you're not really allowed to fudge the truth like that. 
and it ends up with uh, fraud charges and uh, guilty. So, but Nikola still exists. This is a real company. They still have hundreds or perhaps even thousands of employees working on, um, I, I think, less hydrogen and more battery electric now. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they are Do you think they'll trying to dig themselves out of this hole. Do you think they'll come was, up with uh, an electric pickup truck anytime soon? I'm not a pickup yeah, well, truck, but a, like a, a semi -truck. semi truck, long distance. Yeah, I, I think there's a good chance. Like, even when all this controversy was happening, you know, I sort of thought to myself, well, wait a minute. I mean, there's still a giant headquarters here and there's still hundreds of people working there. They have to be working on something. It's not like they're, they're all just uh, sitting around drinking coffee all day. So they're, uh, yeah, I mean, that you know, I still hope the, for the best for Nikola because, you know, the more players we have in this space, the better. Yeah, especially with long distance trucking, but they were hoping to have hydrogen power trucks and build out their own hydrogen network of, uh, and that just seemed like a daunting prospect financially and logistically and they yeah. need an awful lot of people backing them in order to do that because it's tough i mean yeah just like tesla they could start with pre you know pre-prescribed routes between you know bottlers and uh, distribution centers and stuff like that and grocery stores and distribution centers that are uh, unknown length and and you know not maybe not even too long but it's just, yeah, and they even had places that were going to fix them on the road, too. They even had a, a, a series of shops that were ready to fix them. Yeah, and also at the time, like, it really wasn't clear that, you know, even though this is just a few years ago, that, that battery electric semis, you know, you know, people weren't sure how viable that would be. So as we reported last week, the first deliveries of the Tesla semi are going to be on December 1st. I think there are other, some, you know, battery electric big trucks out there. So we'll know soon that, um, you know, battery electric should work for semi-trucking. Now, last week, I touched on um, sort of this myth that goes around that um, land use of renewables is a bad thing. You know, yeah. how can we possibly power 100% of our grid? We do, what are we going to do, cover every square inch with solar and, you know, wind turbines? Uh, and then I pointed out the fact, and this is a fact, that there is more land use by oil and gas right now than what it would take to have 100% renewable energy in the world. So I, I, there's no recent studies, but I came across, and this is actually when I was making the TikTok video for that segment, <laughs> I came across a study, which I found interesting. And now it's, it's already seven years old. Uh, it was published in uh, 2015. It was peer reviewed and published in the scientific journal Science. And it estimated that 30,000 square kilometers have been lost to oil and gas well pads, storage tanks, and associated roads just in the period from 2000 to 2015, just in that 15-year period, 30,000 square kilometers just for oil and gas. So the amount that that is lost, the equivalent of lost rangelands is the equivalent of approximately 5 million animal units per month. I don't want to think about what that is. <laughs> I kind of think I know. And the amount of biomass lost in croplands is equivalent of 120.2 million bushels of wheat, something we have here where we live, lots of wheat. So the thing is, the 3 million hectares of land lost is likely, uh, unlike renewables, long-lasting and potentially permanent. Permanent. Yeah, because this is toxic. Uh, what's, what's left is toxic. Yeah. I mean, we... we Mention a, a hydrogen plant that's trying to build on, um, you know, an old oil and gas. I don't know what do they call it, a gray site or there's a, a brown site, brownfield. They call it brownfields. It's like a gas station, a corner gas station. You can't build a house where there was a corner gas station. That no. land is contaminated forever. Yeah. But if you put in an EV charging supercharger there, you take it out, it's fine. Yeah. You take a wind turbine out, fine. Solar farm. You can not only have agriculture taking place under the solar panels, you take them out and it becomes a farm again or whatever you want, Disneyland. So the gas power plants themselves occupy a rather small landscape footprint, it says. You must take into account that uh, those power plants also require significant infrastructure to operate. Well pads, storage tanks, pipelines, access roads, and refineries, just to name a few. I The pipeline behind my house goes on for many hundreds of kilometers, and I can't imagine the hectares that it in itself takes up, but you cannot do anything on it, I know, because I get a pamphlet in the mail every 10 days telling me I can't, you know, so much fart on it because they don't want me to. 
you know, yeah. I can't bring in a, a backloader because I don't have an alleyway here. I can't, you know, bring in a, a small tractor. I can't bring in anything, anything at all. They don't want, because I talked to them on the phone when I, because I, I get, um, you know, how you dial before you dig. Well, I, I do that. And guess who calls? The pipeline companies actually call when I do that. Yeah. Uh, put out that request to put in my uh, above ground swimming pool. And yeah, they tell me, you can't do anything like that. And yeah. <laughs> Nothing at all. So this, you, and they kill the gophers. So it's, the land is pointless. They, they mow it. They do go over it with a tractor and mow it once a month. But other than that, it's, you know. So the Department of Energy estimates the amount of land used by wind turbines would require 3,200 square kilometers or 790,000 acres by 2050 when we met our Paris climate agreed, you know, targets. And that's roughly a tenth of the land used by oil and gas, uh, which is, uh, yeah, you know, 30% of electricity could be coming from wind for a tenth of the land used by oil and gas. So that's, and that's just in the States, right? So the National Renewable Energy Lab, one hectare or 2.5 2 acres uh, is what you need per gigawatt hour of solar generation, if you want to talk solar now. So for 3 million hectares lost to oil and gas in that 15-year period, you could put up solar power that would generate 75% of America's total annual electricity generation output. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. But, you know, with solar power, like I said, you can put it anywhere. You don't have to put it on farmland. You can put yeah. it on rooftops. You can put it on schools, factories, and you should be. And I don't know why they're not. At least here in North America. In Australia, you're doing a pretty good job. So, Yeah. And that's, remember, this is just oil and gas. This doesn't even talk about other fossil fuels like coal and where entire, you know, mountaintops are removed. So that's my, my story on that. All right. So Volkswagen this week. Um, so we were talking before about um, Hyundai and Kia maybe not making that many battery electric vehicles, even though they're quite great, but I thought this was worth mentioning. We've, we've mentioned Volkswagen's output before, but yeah, Volkswagen's on track to make 500,000 EVs by the end of this year. So 500,000 output in a year. Um, that's behind Tesla, which is going to be around 1.4 million. So just between those two companies, that's around 2 million battery electric vehicles. So this is starting to ramp up. Um, Volkswagen is taking this seriously. And they're taking it so seriously, they've hired Ewan McGregor as their next spokesperson. And of course, we talked about that show that was on Apple TV called The Long Way Down. Long Way Up. Long Way Up. Yeah. Long Way Up. Yeah, a great show. Excellent show. If anyone's interested, um, Ewan McGregor likes to uh, do these tours on motorcycles. So that's the newest iteration of that show. I think there's been three seasons and it's on uh, Apple TV Plus and they started at the tip of South America and uh, drove up to, to California, I think it was, mm -hmm. and in on electric motorcycles and with prototype Rivian electric pickup trucks um, just for the scenery, but also to see if it could be done electric. And it turned out to be an awesome show. So, yeah, clearly Ewan McGregor is an EV enthusiast. Um, he's a big Volkswagen enthusiast. He owns several Volkswagens that he's restored, including one that is a 1954 Beetle that he had converted to electric. So he drives a, a 54 electric Beetle around uh, Los Angeles. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's... Uh, Kind of fun. Yeah. And I, I will point out that there's three iterations of this series, but they started like 20 years ago. Yeah. So when they flash back, he's very young and same, he yeah. has a buddy that he takes with him and that they both like motorcycles and racing and stuff and living on the edge. And it was yeah. very much a struggle with electricity in South America mm -hmm. to charge a, yeah. a prototype Harley Davidson uh, live wire before they even came and out. The earlier previous seasons are just like shot on kind of old standard definition video, so they don't look that great. No. But the newest season that's on Apple TV, it's all in HD, looks fantastic. Oh, yeah. It, it's uh, And really because great it, show. it is essentially a travelogue show, and I yeah. um, became fascinated with South America. What a beautiful continent, yeah. if I may. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they were able to shoot it in glorious HD with lots of drones and, and different things, and the technology that is compact and fits in the motorcycle. Um, you know, operated and unoperated and, 
Yeah, no, and then the first few episodes were the struggle to charge, and then it became more like logistics and things. And they inexplicably went through Mexico on a school bus that they modified, though. Like, it was too dangerous. There was a a, a nasty uh, tourist yeah. murder they, that was an accident. Didn't want to go on. Yeah. Anyway, South America, very beautiful, although, you know, not always stable. I keep hearing about Argentina doing weird things. And, uh, Ewan McGregor is a great guy. I would, uh, he's one of the few Hollywood stars I would like to have a beer with. You know, like he's just, yeah. he seems like a great guy. Yeah, he's awesome. And most people aren't. I'm not. I wouldn't want to have a beer with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible human being. So many flaws, but he seems to have everything worked out. Um, yeah, I, I, Volkswagen promised such lofty things, right? That they were going to mm -hmm. do this and we were hoping they would. Because of Dieselgate, they've sort of abandoned everything and said, okay, we're going all in on EVs, but are they really? And so a lot of people were skeptical, but it seems like, would you, are you fairly comfortable that they are? Oh, yeah. I think 500,000 is an amazing figure to hit this year. It's not an easy thing to, to ramp up all those batteries and, um, you know, new platforms, because it's better to start with a new platform than to convert a, a gas car to electric. So, yeah, Volkswagen is well on their way. When I saw you were doing this story, I watched the Star Wars commercial with him in it. Sort of, uh, he drives off in a Volkswagen ID Buzz, the, uh, well, the, the Volkswagen EV version of their uh, mini bus yeah. van. So, yeah. Which is, by all accounts, horrendously overpriced, but also very cool. And if I was, you know, had a money tree, I would certainly yeah. have one in the driveway <laughs> for the cool and factor. Going to be available in Europe uh, very soon, from what I recall. Yeah. Well, um, the Financial Times has a story on uh, nuclear revival in that Westinghouse Electric, which is a U.S. nuclear power company, uh, it's being bought by um, a private equity-backed consortium in a th almost $8 billion deal for four years. Uh, that's four years after it emerged from bankruptcy. So it was, you know, nuclear was bad, going bankruptcy, not making money um, because of the war in Ukraine is, in their mind, in their view, spurring fresh interest in an industry that had fallen out of investor favor. So uh, we've seen how important um, energy is and nuclear is available now. But also, um, you know, they're partnering with a company that right here in our own province that doesn't have a lot of companies. We have a big multinational corporation called Cameco, which uh, mines uranium in the far north of our problems, uh, the province, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours away that we're into the wilderness where there's a weird little city called Uranium City. You wanted to make a film there once because it was like this abandoned mining yeah. town in the middle of nowhere. No, it's it's a fascinating story. If you want to kind of Google it, Uranium City was a whole city that was built around mining uranium and thousands of people were living there at one point, but it's now been more or less um, abandoned. So there's a whole abandoned city up there that, uh, I don't know, I'd like to just go hang around there. It's sometime. very interesting to look at it from the air because you see the aerial photos and there are what don't seem like dilapidated houses that are completely caved in because the, mm -hmm. the you know some little water thing got in there and then you know one thing led to another with an un you know unoccupied house and then they all sort of collapsed in even though it looks like it has 30 years left on the shingles <laughs> kind of a weird <laughs> image actually um yeah so Cameco is apparently big on nuclear and which is why they are lobbying you know a few provincial governments in Canada like ours to go with small modular nuclear reactors as the solution and as a way to uh, waste our money and prolong fossil fuels. So they, uh, the, the purchasing of uh, Westinghouse, I guess they make up, you know, 440 nuclear reactors in the world, about half of them. So they'll be, uh, I don't know. They say it's the best market fundamentals we've seen in a while. I'm skeptical. I would not advance, would not, uh, I would not invest in that. I'm very I would skeptical. have not invested $8 billion. No, because by the time you put a brick in the ground, I mean, forget about it. It's going to be over. So, well, I'm pleased to bring back the Tweet of the Week. Although I had a hard time finding one this week, so I had to go with a thread, I'm afraid. <laughs> Usually I find an inspiring tweet, something that I really like. But this one's, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of 
climate protesters in the news that has made people uncomfortable throwing soup on paintings and things like that. And it's become a part of the discussion. So Asad Razouk, somebody I follow on Twitter, a uh, energy um, insider, clean energy insider in support of the maligning of these uh, climate protesters, um, he says, we have triggered a once in a hundred million years climate change event. Government policy around the world doesn't appear to give a hoot about it or our future. Why? Well, let's read between the lines of what climate science is saying. The probability of 1.5 degrees heating compared to pre-industrial times by 2100 is today about 99%. The probability of 2 degrees is 90%. The probability of 4 degrees or higher is 10%. And that, of course, is absolutely catastrophic. So it's like, you know, playing Russian roulette with a 10 chamber gun and one bullet in it. And it's the future of humanity and, and life on Earth is... Uh, or at least temporarily going to be disrupted if that happens. So three degrees is unadaptable for most people and will result in tens or hundreds of millions of climate refugees. Four degrees or more implies an exile to high latitudes, North Canada, Siberia, North New Zealand for millennia. That is the most depressing thing I've read in a long time. Uh, remember that the probability of four degrees is actually 10%. So now, if you were faced with these not unlikely outcomes, would you not throw soup at a goddamn painting or stop traffic or strike or block an entrance to BP or Shell or Exxon oil terminals? That is his thoughts. Uh, we like to hear from you on the Clean Energy Show. Coming up next is, what is it, Brian? It's the lightning round. We'll zoom through a bunch of headlines and get through the show real quick. Uh, Contact us right now. Get out your pen. Get out your typewriters. Cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. And we have the Clean Energy Pod. That's our handle. Clean Energy Pod. One word on Twitter and TikTok. We've got a YouTube channel with special features. And we have a voicemail option online where you can leave us an online voicemail. Speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. And it is time for... <laughs> the lightning round a fast-paced look of the week in clean energy news brian the show's gone by fast they all go by fast that's how we're at 135 of them already i don't know what's going on uh maybe the cocaine from the oil industry has gotten into my my coffee in the morning or something but offshore construction starts on japan's first floating wind farm it is in total pretty small 16.8 megawatts they go to wind farm will feature Eight Hitachi 2.1 megawatt turbines installed on hybrid spar type three point mooring floating foundations and come online in a little over a year. Now, the biggest wind turbines that we often mention are 14, though, but those are not floating. So I don't think the floating works for turbines quite that big. But it's nice to see Japan is finally getting going with. Because remember, they've got a deeper offshore, so they need to do the floating in a lot of cases there. Yeah. Uh, Jinko Solar. Uh, has achieved 26.1% efficiency in their solar panels. This is uh, not PERC solar panels, which we're used to, but N-type Topcon solar panels. Um, so the new record was confirmed by China's National Institute of Me Metrology. Is it metrology? Metrology. Sure. Let's say that. It's the science of measurement, Brian, and a word that I didn't previously know because <laughs> I don't measure things. So PERC adds a passivated film to the back of ordinary solar panels to absorb more light than may have passed the initial cell surface. This is how they get this higher efficiency. Now, the panels on our houses might be, what, 18, 9 percent percent efficient or something yeah, like that? Yeah, maybe 20 if we're lucky. And, you know, something like this is significantly higher um, for the same panel. And they, they seem to say that the cost will be very close, too. So they're basically adding this ultra- thin oxide layer on top is another barrier to contain unabsorbed light. They're just trapping more light. And, you know, when you talk about bifacial panels, uh, picking up stuff on the bottom uh, as well, well, normal panels only pick up 70% of the light in the bottom direction, but these pick up 80. So that's a 10% gain, which is nothing to sneeze at if you are making a bifacial solar fam, farm, which sometimes apparently can be vertical. Uh, yeah. Just to smooth out the uh, the curve of the power generation during the day. Yeah, I'm always excited about these advancements in solar panels. 
Um, yeah, like, you know, 18, 19% was, is, you know, typical from a few years ago. So getting up to 26 is great. Now, female workforce share in the renewable energy sector, 32%, oil and gas, 22%. So we're spreading out um, the jobs a bit better as we transition to renewables, something to think about. Uh, few markets are electrifying quite like China, Brian, where EVs have gone from less than 1% of light commercial vehicle sales to 10% in the last 10 year, at last two years, okay? That's fast. Two years, basically nothing, 10%. And this is a, this is a, uh, you know, light commercial vehicles are not like you and I. They're driving all day and they're bigger. <laughs> the vehicles use more energy. So they're bigger and they drive all day. So this is a big impact on oil. And uh, we, I expect very much that this is going to happen soon because we see it every day in the headlines, new uh, small commercial vehicles uh, and trucks coming online that are electric. Oh, it's time for a CES Fast Fact. Yep. It costs about $1,300 to install a public EV charger on a lamp post. $1,300. You know, we talk about how we're going to deal with apartment owners and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, that's not much. This is the whole kit no, and the caboodle and the fact that it charges you too. Uh, you know, the, the whole billing system is built into it. $1,300 yeah. US. No, we have tons of cars that park on the street all day long so why not give them an option to charge That's and uh, keep in mind these use you use your own cord for stuff like this it's basically a socket and yeah in europe they bring their own cord audi wants its evs to clean the air while they charge or drive this is if i had a segment the weird story of the week this would be it brian this is weird <laughs> and by the way i once saw a thing where they had a train that was going to carbon capture as it drove but i lost the story but right. I was going to talk about it on the show about six months ago. So Audi wants to do this with their cars. Their vehicles will be equipped with the systems of filters particles out of the air. This is a test. This is an experiment. Um, they'll do it passively when they're driving it and actively with a fan when they're charging. And they're just going to take particles out of the air through, I don't know. It's just, it's not going to make a difference. <laughs> it's going to add cost to the car. Why are they doing this, Brian? Why? I don't know. It seems like the dumbest thing ever. Pennsylvania State University researchers develop 10-minute charging method. Now we hear about this stuff all the time, and we don't mention it on the show. Why? Because we don't know if it's real or not. However, yeah. this was published in the journal Nature, which is the journal, the top journal. This is no bigger journal than Nature, as far as I'm I love concerned. it. It's my favorite journal. Absolutely. That's what, they have that written on the cover. Brian Stockton's favorite <laughs> journal. And it's only why I mention it, because adding a thin layer of nickel to the battery, which is also why I mention it, because it's not a huge, weird thing that may or may not work. Right. It's a minor thing that is actually helping it cool the battery. And uh, something like Tesla might develop, something like that. Well, they're adding a thin layer of nickel in the spooling to help with the cooling, and that means that they can charge uh, in 10 minutes. So that might be a thing. Okay? It might be a thing. Yeah, I mean, might potentially add too much cost because nickel is one of the more expensive materials for batteries, but we'll see. Oh, it's another CAS fast fact. All of the lithium mined last year would last just one month in 2040. One month. All the, the lithium mined last year would last one month. And in 2050, that magical year where we have to get to zero, it would last two weeks. So this is based on, I guess, current projections of how much lithium we're going to need to put into batteries and such in 2040. And it could be wrong. We could be onto batteries that don't require any lithium by then. I'm hoping it's possible. Yeah, we'll see. Um, especially for grid, you know, and stuff like that. Electric. Miners are cutting CO2 emissions in half by switching to electric vehicles. So I, I know that mining was ripe for electric vehicles because you have to clean the air as you go down in the mines. That's yeah. an issue to have a diesel truck running or um, equipment. So if you electrify it and you throw out a solar farm, yeah, it's even better. No, and there was a story this week about um, a hockey rink somewhere switching to electric-powered Zambonis to clean the ice. And um, if you've ever been in a hockey rink... Um, it's ridiculous. Like they have these gas powered Zambonis driving around, especially in a smaller, like community sized rink 
Um, the fumes are ridiculous. We shouldn't be breathing no. in those fumes. It's, and it's the same thing with mining. Like, you know, you don't want to be uh, burning fossil fuels down in a mine. You want clean battery electric power. And like every decent Canadian, Brian was born on the blue line of a high socky rink, weren't you, back in the of day? Course. Many years ago, many, many years ago. Yeah, but I, I, you know what surprises me, though, is it's half. Half the emissions from mining can come from electrifying the vehicles. That's really good. That's yeah. I didn't know that it would be that great because that's easy. And by the way, yeah. we, we've seen even years ago, early in the podcast, um, you know, giant supersized trucks that are electrified that are going up yeah. and down coal mines that just completely yeah. recharge on the way down. Yeah. And they don't even have to charge during the day. And they just... Yeah you know, regenerate going down with the regenerative braking. Uh, BYD Atto 3 scored five stars in the Euro NCAP safety test. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because I've often pondered with you on the show, uh, what are the Chinese cars going to be like when they come? Are they going to be safe? Now, that's a bit of maybe an unwanted, undeserved prejudice that is coming uh, from bad Chinese uh, manufacturing and quality from past decades in the 80s and 90s. But then a lot of people said that about the Koreans. And actually, the Korean cars weren't great at first, but they yeah. became quite, they're among the top reliable cars now. Now they're great. Uh, but so this is the first sort of indication that I've seen that the Chinese cars can do and will strive to have uh, high safety ratings because we're all in North America here going to be craving good, safe cars. You know, that's that, that's that affected my buying decision uh, last time. Oh, another fast fact. U.S. wind power currently generates enough electricity to serve the equivalent of 43 million American homes. That's right now. Already. Just with wind power. Wow. Just with wind power. That's what it's capable of at its best case scenario. From Carbon Tracker, new findings from Rystead Energy show that uh, 2022 capital spending on wind and solar could hit almost half a trillion dollars. And that would eclipse the $446 billion for upstream oil and gas production. So this is kind of the first time that, you know, the, uh, the capital spending has switched from bad to good. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they say it's not going back, that, that this trend will continue uh, quite rapidly going forward. Absolutely. One last story for you, Brian. The World Meteorological Organization, rather, says that occurrences of severe weather disrupting the operation of nuclear power plants increased fivefold in the last three decades between 1990 and 2019, with a notable acceleration since 2009, something that we've been mentioning on the show that I found quite surprising. And yeah, climate change screwing things up already. Yeah, extreme weather is not great for nuclear power plants. And that is our time for this week. I mean, we could go on forever, but, you know. Let's not. I'm, I'm, my throat will start to bleed very shortly. Brian will pass out. I've got a cold. He's, got, got to he's barely up. alive, man. He's probably got some sort of new version of COVID that can't be detected. That's what I think. It's not a cold. Uh, we'll hope you're here for next week's show. So we love to hear from you. Remember, clean energy show at gmail.com, Twitter, TikTok, yada, yada, yada. Leave us a voicemail. And if you're new to the show, remember, subscribe on your podcast app because we have new shows every week and you wouldn't want to miss that. So we'll see you next time. See you next week.